Good morning, everybody. This is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast, and we are here to conclude our deep dive into the Natalia Grace documentary that has so enriched our lives over the last few weeks. Now, we've done a, a total of probably over 10 hours of video, and tonight, with everything that we've talked about, we're finally going to explore the statements from Christine in response to the documentary that I know so many of you have been curious about. Why hasn't she said anything? We're going to talk about exactly what's going on with the man's and that whole dynamic. And I'm going to address some of your guys' comments coming up next. Let's get started. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrano with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. Here we go. So, episode five of the Natalia Grace series. Episode five is titled Trauma Bond. The main theme of this episode was it, it tried to represent this bond between Michael and Natalia as they were coming together to share their traumas. It wasn't supposed to be that, but Michael decided to turn it into that. As you recall, way back on episode one, they get in and then he starts talking about how he's a victim. And then Antoine Mann gets upset because he used the word hell or some other curse word and then just derailed the whole thing. So round two, everybody's back. Terrence Kennard, Michael's attorney, was not allowed to be there. Antoine Mann was not allowed to be there. It was just Natalia and Michael. And they start off with Natalia saying, look, I just want some resolution. I want some peace of mind. She says, you know, she wants to answer questions, whatever. Michael jumps on the camera and he had this very curious way of putting it. And, you know, it glazed over the first time I watched it. But, you know, watching it with a more analytical eye the second time around, he says that I'm kind of looking for all these pieces of warning signs. I'm on edge. I'm on nerve. Meaning, you know, basically every time Natalia says anything, mm -hmm. he's worried that it's going to like reflect poorly on him or some legal mm -hmm. liability. I don't know. It was just this curious statement. He, he used it, an example of like a nuclear bomb. I'm listening for whistles. I'm listening for emergencies, whatever, because he's afraid of what Natalia is going to say. He's paranoid. <laughs> yeah. And so Natalia... She wanted to know, number one, why did you guys adopt me in the first place? Why didn't he step in when Christine was fighting with her? And then why didn't he defend her? Mm -hmm. Point blank. It's the same questions that you and I have all asked of Michael throughout. And, you know, we can't really come up with a good reason. And I think that you came up with probably the correct one because he was complicit. So a lot of our listeners and one of our listeners in particular, his name is Wiz dome he's a he's one of my favorite commenters he really takes his time and puts a lot of time and effort into res his responses he's been dutifully following along all of our episodes and he asked the question in so many words in this lengthy post you know how much credibility could we assign to michael given everything that we know exactly. and well I'll, t I'll tell you the answer what comes out of Michael's mouth is almost unimportant mm -hmm. because in a number of exchanges in this one-on-one -on -one session that he has with Natalia, he's very clearly and blatantly lying. And it's not like we're speculating that he's lying. We have video receipts of him telling Natalia one thing and then on video back in season one saying completely different things or in depositions saying completely things, different things. He's 100% a liar. No doubt about it. But there are moments, there are moments where he has these candid, lucid times where he, it appears that he, he seems credible to some degree. Now, look, it's very difficult to listen to Michael because yes. <laughs> he could be so infuriating to listen to. He could be so annoying. Annoying. He's theatrical. I've, I feel like I've listened to him enough to kind of gain his tells. Yes. I agree. Whenever he's being truthful, I mean, there's not really any, he's any hesitation. Mm -hmm. He just spits out, you know, and so there's times where he does that thing, which is different from all the other times. For example, when he's talking about meeting up with the Chaconis at the very first time, when he says, I never met them. I believe that what he 
is really saying is I never saw them that day because mm -hmm. there's email exchanges. He knew their names. There's all this other kind of stuff. He's still trying to push this narrative that it was a closed adoption when very clearly it was not. And we already know that. So why yes. is he still saying that? But, you know, there's moments where I believe that he believes what he's saying. That's the thing. <laughs> Even if it's not altogether yes. true, right? <laughs> but there are these other times he very clearly came into round two with an agenda. His agenda is this. Oh, yes, he does have an agenda. <laughs> he wants to deflect all of the blame to Christine. We share the same monster. Um, I was a victim too. We were going this together. This is the trauma bond, which they curiously named this. And by the way, mm -hmm. it completely slipped my eye. I didn't realize, you know, the two FBI agents on the show. Yes. They have a role in producing this show as well. Oh, okay. One of our commenters had pointed that out. I didn't know that, which makes sense because they don't really offer much in the way of like legal analysis. They're just, yeah. there's some video of the female she's interviewing Natalia when she's a child. And you know, the man, the, yes. the older gentleman, mm -hmm. he gets up there and he says some things, but I had no idea that there were, that they were sort of involved in also producing this documentary. I mean, it wasn't solely them. There was other folks involved as well. But so before we get too far into that, Natalia, she asked those three questions. They cut to Terrence. Mm -hmm. Now, on your first, let me ask your opinion. The first time you heard Terrence, the attorney for Michael, mm -hmm. talk about Natalia, what was your impression of him? I will have to remember the first time that I... <laughs> well, he gets up there and he starts saying about how Natalia is not innocent in all of this and she has behavioral issues. But when he's speaking, he speaks with an air of credibility. He seems compelling. He's got a good speaking voice. He, yeah, he does have a good speaking voice. He, I mean, if he were in court, you would probably believe him. Mm-hmm. Um, if he were a jury, he has a good courtroom presence. Yes, he seems credible. He yes. He seems believable. Yes. If you dive deeper into what he's really saying, it's just a load of BS. Yes. It's one huge, big red mm -hmm. herring that he's trying to throw out there for specifically the protection mm -hmm. of Michael Barnett. Look, he's done a good job. He he won the criminal trial. Yes. He got Michael acquitted. Mm -hmm. Good for him. Bravo. But you know what? Terrence also is aware that these civil suits are incoming. Yes. They're coming and he knows it and it's going to be an issue of liability. And maybe we'll get into some of what that lawsuit is going to look like, but it's going to, it's going to, this is basically what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I feel like they should have one of the causes of action be related to fraud that they purposely and fraudulently misled the courts into re-aging her. They caused a lot of, you know, yes. some of these damages, obviously child neglect, child abuse, a number of different things. Statute of limitations plays a huge role in all of this. Um, We've kind of already discussed some of those things in season one, mm -hmm. but regardless of, of what it looks like, they are coming. And so Michael came into this with an agenda. Oh, yes. Terrence came into this with an agenda to shield or deflect the blame of these allegations onto Christine. Paint him as a sympathetic figure as much as you can. And I'll tell you what. In season one. Mm -hmm. Which kind of highlighted. Michael playing a heavy role into the abuse yes. that was heaped on Natalia. And I'm thinking specifically back to the video that Michael took on a cell phone mm -hmm. when he found out that Natalia had called the CPS worker. Yes. When he, he got all pissed off about it and then he stripped her of her cell phone. Or, or that's not what he did. I think he just deleted all of her contacts or whatever, Something erased like it. That, yes. Yeah, but then he's like, you know, berating her about, you know, food that she got. How do you got that? Donuts, donuts. and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And he's trying to take this video to say, look at all the stuff that you have, mm -hmm. you know, to basically make the case that we're providing for you as a disabled person the way that we're required to do by law because of the Indiana statute mm -hmm. that we had read on the last episode. So he's going, that was kind of our first glimpse into mm -hmm. Michael. And on that season, I had nothing but hatred for that man. Mm -hmm. Nothing but, you know, the, the, I mean, his value as a man to me was lower than low, but they did manage at the very end, at the very end in episode six, Natalia and Michael, they have a moment. And Michael's on his yeah. ease. And it's like this weird kind of production about, you know, she's praying for him. And then Michael looks like a, you know, choir boy. And, you know, it's, <laughs> he's crying. Interestingly there. Okay. So there was moments. Mm -hmm. I'll save that for episode six. Okay. But 
let's uh, continue before I don't want to get out of order. So anyway, they begin round mm-hmm. one. They go, so where do we start? And then one of the questions that Natalia asked, why didn't I leave? Why didn't he leave Christine? That mm-hmm. was the question that left yes. off of, right? Why didn't he just leave? And then he goes into this whole (laughs) emotional diatribe. And he says something to the effect of, well, it's very difficult to understand. You're not going to like everything that you hear. And then he goes, after 15 years of being put down and degraded and controlled Mm -hmm. and threatened, I didn't have any strength to stand up to her. And I wish I did, but I didn't. And then he talks about this, this, he draws this analogy with the movie Monsters, Inc., I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but you have a four-month-old. It's been so long that I don't remember. You will watch it again. I know, I'm sure. I saw it many years ago when my 17-year-old was, you know, of that age watching those kinds of movies. But he says there's something about, oh, we have the same monster, you Mm -hmm. know, all the characters in that movie. And then he says, you and I, Natalia, Mm -hmm. we have the same monster. Yes. And then he says, and we didn't know it. For years, and Natalia was crying, and, you know, at at this point, I don't know what it's like to be a psychologist or a therapist. Mm -hmm. I know that I couldn't do it because it would weigh very heavily on me, but we kind of know what it's Mm -hmm. like because people try to turn us into those, our clients. They want to talk about all the emotional stuff. Yes. But she starts crying, and she's it's like it feels like genuine tears. Like she's clearly Mm -hmm. trying to put pieces of the puzzle together and that's a common thing for natalia from the very beginning of season one going into season two i'm just i'm trying to figure out who i am Mm -hmm. what happened i don't know what happened to the ukraine i don't know who the strange man was that put the towel over my face i don't like it when people know that i've been reagent all of these things come out and she's really trying to figure this out she's going through genuine pain Mm -hmm. she's going through genuine trauma that has been documented and verified for whatever you think her uh, behavioral proclivities are. And then, you know, Michael, of course. So they start to bond a little bit over Michael was successful Mm -hmm. and saying, look, we're on the same side. We both don't like Christine. She victimized both of us. And then Beth Karras jumps in, which at this point, I'm not really sure what her, she's not really providing much legal analysis. She's Mm -hmm. just kind of offering her opinions, which is fair because it's kind of what we're doing. So (laughs) good for her. Um, But she says that this is a moment where Natalia and Michael are bonding. They're both victims of Christine. She's starting to warm up to them. And she did. Michael did a really good job of kind of making friends. The trauma bond, which is a thing. Mm -hmm. There is this podcast that I listened to. I think it's called is this happening or something? Okay. And people go on that podcast to basically trauma dump on the world. Like all of these bad things that happen to them. It's really difficult to listen to for too long because it just gets to be like, I mean, is this what we're doing now? We're just going to like talk about all of our problems. And like they, like these people, they get, mm-hmm. I don't know what they get from telling their stories. I was going to ask like, what's the purpose other than. I want to put it out there, like tell the story, you know, but like, it's very specifically for the purpose. They have all these catchphrases like mm-hmm. trauma dump mm-hmm. and okay. I'm jumping all my tra- trauma on you. And obviously I was triggered and there's all this new age woke language yes. that, you know, is unfamiliar to me, but it's a whole facet of psychological rehabilitation yes. that people with trauma, they go through these things. And so that shows the vote. It's difficult. Listen for me. It's compelling yes. at some points. Every now and then on a long drive, I'll put it all on my wife. And, really? Yeah. I'm, I mean, it's either that or we listen to true crime stuff. I like the true crime stuff. <laughs> we listen to uh, Joe Rogan. We listen to, uh, well, we listen to all kinds of stuff. We listen to uh, The Rewatchables by Bill Riley, I think is his name. We listen to all kinds of stuff. That's I mean, one of the shows that we listen to. I can to. see how it could be your, your, your therapeutico in Spanish because I can't see it in English. So therapeutico, therapeutic? Therapeutic. <laughs> that, yeah. that I can't say. Yeah. Because it's how some people deal with trauma, just saying it and yeah. repeating it. I just don't know if I could just listen. I mean, my bachelor's is in psychology. At some point, I wanted to be a psychologist. Mm. But I don't think I can listen to that. It's hard. Just... Or fun. <laughs> Imagine doing that for eight hours a day. I mean, I, I don't know how the therapists do it. I mean, it, it's just a, it's a tough job. I think that's why I ended up not going that route because I realized that I would have been maybe too blunt. Yeah. Same. 
And then I was like, okay, then maybe that helps with the law. <laughs> I, I There was a point in my career where I thought about getting a JD and a PhD in psychology mm -hmm. and kind of like dual yes. doing it. But it was like, you know, th there's no way. I can't. I got no energy. And, and then I didn't. And so mm -hmm. now I'm just a lawyer. And so, But you're in family law, which kind of yeah. puts you in a position where yes, you serve does. as the therapist for your clients because it's a very emotional process to go through custody or divorce. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so. 100%. So here's Natalia's question. She says, so what do you know that Christine did? What do you know? This is a very delicate question for Michael to answer because yes. it breaches into the area of civil liability, mm -hmm. criminal liability. There was even some points where Michael's like, I don't know, statute of limitations. We've got to be able to get Christine for something. He's trying to get on her side. Yeah. But if he, you know, what he knows plays into what he was able to reasonably do to protect. And so it's a del it's a delicate question. So he says. He goes um, in circles. <laughs> oh, yeah. Circles yes. like NASCAR. Yes. Daytona 500. He says, I know. Some things I just learned. I'm afraid of what I don't know. And it's this meandering 60 second response. I'm afraid of what I don't know. I know little. I don't know a lot. I sort of know some things, but it's there's just... some things I don't want to know about. <laughs> some things I blocked out. It's like, all right. Okay. You said nothing. <laughs> okay. And then he says, Natalia just doubles down. Hey, so what do you know? Michael's like, well, that's a very long answer. It could take mm -hmm. us a week. What does he sound like? He sounds like a guy that's quibbling yes. because he doesn't want to give the correct, mm -hmm. the wrong answer. Exactly. So in his mind, the wheels are spinning. What should I say? What can't I say? Terrence is over there. Well, mm -hmm. he wasn't in the room there, but he had clearly gotten instructions from Terrence. He's worried about lawsuits. And Natalia suggested he's probably worried about the mm -hmm. court of public opinion because nobody likes Michael. No. But he does have his protectors. That he definitely does. I can imagine. I've seen Everybody, some of them on the comments. Even the biggest monsters have their yeah fans <laughs> for sure. Christopher Watts, Ted Bundy, name yes, a serial exactly. killer. They got a fan club. Everybody. Yeah. So he says, "I'm afraid of things I don't know about. I'd rather just not know that." And there are such horrible things in the world. And then he says, "The only chance I have is if all of us." If everyone just stands up and says, this is what happened and this is what she did. She did it. She can't scream and lie her way out of this. He's clearly trying to position himself on the side of Natalia and make her friends. So Terrence Kennard gets on and says that, oh, he's not being evasive. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he's not being evasive. This is Terrence, is what he says. He says, my experience with Michael, he says, I think he suffered from PTSD, mental trauma as a result of his marriage. And I know that he believes that Christine is the reason. So, well, that's what Terrence says. Yeah. I happen to agree with Terrence. A little bit. That Michael probably does have some PTSD mm -hmm. with, look, Christine, I've dealt with her type in family law. Oh, Dozens of times. Mm -hmm. And the vindictive Christine type that videos every single thing that has this way of igniting the flame. And then when it explodes, pressing record yes. to get herself to look like the victim. I've met, I've, mm -hmm. I've come across. They're a real thing to steal your kids, to mm -hmm. take half of your stuff, to take all of your stuff. There are vindictive women. I have no doubt. That's what he married, and she ate him alive because she, I discussed on the last show, is a predator. Yes. Michael is not. No. He was no match for Christine. And look, anybody that was a match for Christine would not be married to her. Exactly. There's no chance. <laughs> there's no chance. The first time you blow up like that, there's no chance it's going anywhere. And then we kind of got into some of her dating romances, romance choice. I forget the the little person's name, yes. the one she dated, but I you know, she tends to date people that are weaker than her, or she perceives to be weaker than her to get the upper hand. And then she manipulates and uses her, what she believes to be her femininity mm -hmm. uh, to ma get them to do what they want. And so just like that other, what's the name of that lady? The one that was in the, that cult with a guy that apparently wrote books that they believe in people's, demons and the light and 
what was her name? Oh, Lori Vallow. Yes. Lori Vallow. Yes, like her. Yes. yes. One of the things that was discussed, it, it played in episode one about whether or not it was mm-hmm. an open or a closed adoption. Yes. Very clearly it was an open adoption. Michael's still trying to perpetrate that it was a closed adoption. But one of the issues was um, that they actually had met. Of course, in a closed adoption, you're not supposed to meet the, the surrendering parents. Mm-hmm. The adoptive parents and the surrendering parents are never supposed to meet. And Natalia says, no, I clearly remember. They're all in the same room. Everybody had acknowledged each other and, you know, Matt, not to mention that there's emails and there there's uh, exchanges and there's conversation and record of medical documents. Never mind. So one of the questions that Natalia poses, do you remember meeting the family I was with before? And this is one of the times where Michael, <laughs> I feel like he believes what he's saying. Yes. At the same time, I have questions, but he says, oh, no, nope, never met him. And then he says they were in a room that was across from ours, but he's very manipulative in the way that he does this. So he says, they're in a room next to ours. And I could remember that everybody was so excited to meet you. And I remember that there, this was the layout of the room. And then we kept on, like, we heard you making noises in there. And we kept on putting our ear up to the wall. And we were so excited. We're bringing home our new daughter, our new sister. And, you know, trying to, like, play up the yeah, good feelings yes. and turning and flipping into this positive thing. But, yeah, never met the Jaconis. Why he feels the need to say that when we got the receipts uh, mm-hmm. that clearly they have met um, is beyond me. But he seemed believable to the extent that I believe he believes. That's something that I guess you could appreciate about him. He might be a liar. He believes his lies and he yeah. stands like his foot like this is it. Like, yeah. And it gets to the point where you question yourself like if you didn't have the receipts like. Really? Did it happen yeah. like that? But we do have the receipts, so we he would that. Uh, <laughs> no, he would seem credible yeah. if you were listening to him as a juror. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And he was on the witness stand. Oh, well, it seems like he was pretty confident in that. But, I mean, we, of course, know better. But we, that type of person, I think, is dangerous because if we didn't have the receipts, if we didn't have the proof, yeah. he probably could have gotten away. That is why he said, she said, cases are so mm-hmm. dangerous. Exactly. And it's why because he's believable. being an attorney is a lot harder than it looks. Mm-hmm. Because it's one thing to know that he's lying. No, how do you prove it? Exactly. Evidence code. No, I just had this conversation with somebody that came in yesterday. He's like, okay, I want to bring him up for contempt about he was drinking about all these things. He's like, on four separate yeah. occasions, he was drinking in front of the kids. Like, okay, well, what is how? your evidence? Mm-hmm. Well, my sister-in-law said that he uh, was, okay... Is she going to come in and testify to say that? Well, maybe. <laughs> okay, but what if she doesn't? Well, then there was this other soft, this swap meet employee that says that he was, she saw him drink. It's, okay, well, how do you know her? Well, mm-hmm. I don't really. So what do you think the odds are that she's going to come in and testify exactly. and get herself involved? And it's like, I, I could subpoena her, but she, if, she's, if she doesn't show up anyway... You don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And then what's the other? Well, my five-year-old daughter says, okay, but she's five. Mm -hmm. And the judge is going to be like, okay, children say things like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Could she have been mistaken? Could she have been mistaken? And then she's wanting to bring up contempt charges, which is a higher proof, a burden of proof than a regular. And so, yeah, it's difficult to prove that somebody is lying if you don't have the receipts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, law is law is hard. And the receipts sometimes are there, but you cannot bring them to court. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. Because she's, she'll say, well, everybody knows in the family that he drinks. Okay, so all of them are going to say that? Okay. Well, what about my sister-in-law said that she talked to this other person that said mm-hmm. that she saw him in the drive. Okay, well, that's like triple hearsay. Exactly. So how are we going to do that? <laughs> that's not going to work out. You can't testify about things that other people said. If you weren't a recipient witness, it's not going to come in. And so... Before I get too far in the weeds with that. <laughs> We're going to go into the hearsay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Explain hearsay to everybody. <laughs> so he says, I remember that day too. <laughs> Natalia says, she's pushing back. Says, no, look, I remember that day too. I remember sitting in a chair across from where you guys were, but I remember Diane and Gary coming into the room. And then Michael reiterates, I never met him. And then he says that the adoption by shepherd care people told us it was a closed adoption. He didn't have to say that. Nobody asked him about a, clo- yeah. a closure open adoption, but very clearly, Terrence must have advised him that might come up and just to reiterate certain things. Volunteering information. Yeah. Oh, no, closed <laughs> adoption. Okay, nobody asked if it was closed or open. Mm-hmm. It, but then he says he, he 
he even spoke the legal language. The surrendering family did not want any information shared with us. They didn't want to meet us because he's trying to cover his ass. He's going to die on that flag, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we know different. Natalia says, I remember Diane and Gary came out. They told me that you guys wanted to see me. And then he says, well, but they never came in the room and talked to us. Mm -hmm. We know they had medical records and their names. Oh, that was my notes. I know that they had the medical records and their names from the emails that yes, were exchanged. Exactly. Yeah. And then they kind of move on. All right. So whatever with that situation, Natalia then asks, do you remember putting a lock on my door? And then he says, yeah, uh, we were told to do that by the doctors. Put a lock on her door, which seems odd. Yes, it does. I don't know of a doctor that would say that because it's not a medical instruction unless it's like a, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to know that a doctor would never say that or advise to do that. It just seems like a weird instruction for uh, somebody in Natalia's condition. But let's continue. Do you remember what happened to me when you were putting the lock on the door? And then Michael's like, nope. And Natalia says, so you don't, you didn't realize that Christine was hitting me with a belt and letting the boys hit me? And letting Jacob drop me. And then genuine tears from Natalia, mm-hmm. clearly reliving some kind of a trauma. <sighs> Let's talk a little bit about the human condition. Okay. People are evil. Yes. They're sincerely evil. Mm-hmm. People clearly take sides with this case. There is a contingent of people out there. And I know this just because I've done some of the research regarding Natalia. She has an Instagram. She has a, not a Facebook, I think a TikTok, TikTok or something. Yeah. It was made famous because of the Antoines and that phone call. Okay. But there is clearly a contingent of people that if they don't support the Barnett's completely believe that Natalia is out for financial gain. And they mm-hmm. say the nastiest, rude, just disgusting things to her. I've seen it also in the news articles. On Facebook, you can see in the comments, yeah. there's a lot of people on their side. <laughs> I mean, she raised like $21,000 in a GoFundMe. He's like, see, she she's clearly doing this for the money. Oh, clearly $21,000 is making her rich. Yes. I mean, <laughs> she's got to earn an income. Some I don't yes. care what she's got to do to earn the income. Start a GoFundMe. But uh, yeah, people have vilified her for because... They think that she's profiting off of this. And she probably is to some degree. Is it making her rich? I don't know. I doubt it. Yeah, but it's her right. It is her God-given American right. Not even American right. It is her right Mm -hmm. as a human being to uh, earn an income. And if she's getting money because of all the things that she's gone Mm -hmm. through. I mean, you know how many people have profited off of people being interested in their stories. And because Natalia is doing it, and there's whole discourse behind it. You know, people are trying to vilify her. But the things that have gone, the allegations in this case Mm -hmm. that have been raised have been corroborated. Her behavioral issues, there's accounts and there's, you know, things that she may have done behaviorally. We already talked about that. Yes. I view that as nothing more than a symptom of the abuse that she has undergone. Exactly. And, but they're focusing, oh, you're getting money off it. Okay, so should she do this for free? (laughs) <laughs> Just put herself out in the public discourse for millions of people to opine about, you know, whether or not she's actually an adult or a child and just put all of her business out there. That is a what huge <laughs> ask of anybody. I mean, mm-hmm. just the audience that we even have on YouTube, just the way that we put ourselves out there, our opinions, mm-hmm. it's subject to people coming into attack. Exactly. And they could do it without credentials and, you know, without consequence and anonymously. Mm-hmm. And so... Anytime you put yourself out there, it it costs something of your soul to do that because you're exposing a portion of yourself. Mm-hmm. And Natalia, for to ask her to do this for free is beyond ridiculous. It is. And it just what does that say about the human condition that there are those that choose to side with her for being a victim of this abuse? There are those that choose to side with their Barnett's on account of, well, they were justified in their actions, at least partially. And there are those that decide to say, I don't care about the merits of the case. 
She shouldn't be profiting off of this and pass judgment on her and to call her all of these derogatory names and to uh, humiliate and do all of these things to her. What does that speak to the human condition other than to reiterate my years long, almost lifelong thought that I really hate people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I agree. People are crazy. I don't like any of you guys, man. Like, yeah. what is wrong with you guys? Like, what is, like, what is the deal? Sometimes, I mean, I don't hate you guys. I would invite all of you to come and sit and break bread <laughs> and you know have a drink. That's in our intro. Why don't yes. you come and have a drink and join me? We're gonna sit and we're gonna talk like people. Yes, these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney. I've memorized it, but <laughs> it's. I love discourse with mm -hmm. human beings intelligent discourse exactly what i don't like is these people that come and they take shots and they just decide to pass judgment on this little girl um, no matter what her age is without taking into account the merits and they get stuck on things and so i don't like traveling into the pool of human beings where all of this is readily afoot i have so many different avenues i could go off on that but i'm gonna <laughs> re refrain your thoughts there's a lot of people that go by emotion, other people that go more by, I don't know, I guess logic. Mm. And I think there's a lot of people that don't have emotional intelligence. Yes. And I think it's a big that one. that's why there's so much discord into like which side to take. I mean, this world is crazy. It's well, the world is hard on people, yeah. you know? I it mean, is. everybody has their own personal narrative. Exactly. You woke up this morning and through your own eyes, you have your own personal struggles mm -hmm. and you've got to get dressed and you got to get your daughter ready. Mm -hmm. And you have a husband and you have all of these things and you got bills and finances and you have this whole backstory mm -hmm. and the movie of your life is completely different from mine, exactly. but everybody has their own movie. And we are so quick to pass judgment and we lack empathy for each other and kindness for each other. And then, you know, when somebody says one wrong thing, that might be a criticism to somebody's character to get overly offended because how dare you? Um, you know, the comment about Rachel Ambler, there is one listener, one listener mm -hmm. that had commented. I'm going to tell you what he said, because I told him that I would even though it, was, it goes against my better judgment, but he left a comment. It didn't anger me. Okay. I was more perplexed at what he said. And this is what he said. What I basically said was, I don't remember if I said this or not, but I called, I may or may not have called Rachel Ambler simple minded, but I think what I was referring to was simple minded people and how they could be swayed yes. by people. And That's I didn't sweet. mean that she was simple minded, like as a simple, unintelligent person. And this is the, the neighbor lady. Am uh, the orange lady. Yes. The orange. Yes. Poor thing. And, yeah. Just the orange lady. <laughs> <laughs> right. It just goes, look, people are swayed by words. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the act of her speaking to Christine in full agreement that, oh, Natalia is this evil person trying to murder the whole family and then being confronted by Natalia in that moment and just completely flipping it and just making it sound like if I knew that was going on, I would have scooped you right mm -hmm. up. But she did not. Is it simple mindedness or is it an act of cowardice to not stand up for your convictions? Did you have any convictions when Christine was telling you all of those things? Did, were you convicted in the sense that you really believe Christine was in danger of being murdered and her whole family by this little three foot, three and a half foot Natalia Grace? Or was that something that you did because Christine was pressuring you? And of course, that's what she reverted to. Mm -hmm. Christine is a good talker and she pressured me into doing things. But then when Natalia confronts you about that and kind of gives you her truth about it, you completely flip. Is it simple mindedness? Is it an act of cowardice or cowardice? Mm -hmm. Or is it something else? I personally, through my life experience, mm -hmm. attribute it as both. Yeah, I, I have um, like both. <laughs> yeah, I've been simple minded about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. For example, this morning, I, wa I walked to court. I went to court. You saw me there. Yes. <laughs> As I was coming out, I went to court in the wrong shoes. I literally had tennis shoes on with my suit and didn't realize it no, no. <laughs> until after I left the courthouse. And uh, I looked down. I was like, ah, wow. oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> nothing I can do about it now. And um, it happens. Mm -hmm. The act of being simple minded is not a it's not an attack on your intelligence. Mm -hmm. It is just a state of mind. 
in that thing. There are things that we devote our resources to mentally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, I happen to be simple-minded in a lot of them. My my critique of Rachel was specifically her ability to flip-flop like mm -hmm. that and not have a backbone and stand up for what her convictions were. Her convictions in this matter, whoever has been speaking to her first. Yes. What do you think about all of that? Well, before we go into that, if I didn't know you and I would have seen you in court with the tennis shoes, I would have judged you. I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have judged you. <laughs> but yeah. no, I mean, I agree with you when it comes to Rachel. I think it's a mix of the two, the cowardness and also being simple minded. I mean, and there's a lot of people like that. It's. It is what it is. It's look, man. It's the power of words. It's exactly. our it's our ability to invest mm -hmm. in the words of others for various reasons. And this guy, I wanted to address what he said. Mm -hmm. He says, this is what he says. I don't know if he's a psychologist or not, but he says, it's not you are not a lawyer, not a psychologist. Many highly intelligent people get lured into cults. Mm -hmm. Not just simple-minded people, which I wholeheartedly agree. Yes. It's not about intelligence. It's about what's going on in their lives. They're usually looking for something and are at a low time in their lives or searching for a place to belong. I have a story about a cult. Mm -hmm. I was a part of one for a couple of years. Okay. So when I was like 16, 17, 18 years old, I was very much in search of truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would classify myself as highly intelligent, but I was in search of something and I was wanting to find the answers. And I got lured into this church. Mm -hmm. It was called the International Churches of Christ. It okay. was this offset Christian denomination. And I was all about it. It's like, and, and they were so manipulative in the way that they would go about it. They would use, it was Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, which basically said, and Jesus said unto them to go out and, uh, spread the gospel into the world. You are disciples and to spread the word and create more disciples and trading, uh, creating more uh, Christians, disciples until the end of the age, until I come back, something like that. Basically mm -hmm. giving this mission that you are to join me. You're going to and be a disciple people. of Christ and go out and recruit mm -hmm. the church based their entire uh, foundation on that biblical verse. And then they would take you through a series of seven spiritual biblical lessons to okay. say, okay, uh, you are a sinner, and this is what you did to Christ. And then we take you through the medical account autopsy of what Jesus Christ would have went through on crucifixion okay. and get you to feel guilt. And then we, they would be like this truth sermon, like, I want you to admit all of the sins that you've done. I want you to admit that you are a, a garbage. I want you to admit that you are not saved. And I want mm -hmm. you to admit that you want Jesus Christ to be a part of your life and admit that you're going to surrender and become a disciple. This whole seven study series, okay. and at the end of that results in this very public mm -hmm. baptism underwater in front of the whole congregation. And therefore you would have, you would become a disciple okay. and they would replace your entire social circle to be only other disciples. Mm -hmm. People that were not a disciple were those of the world and those of the world were unsaved. And we had, were charged with the act of going to save them. Your mom, your dad, your parents, your brothers, cousins, all of them are going to hell. That's like that with Lori. Y yes. But, but instead of monsters or spirits. Right. But under their religion. <laughs> then it was like, okay, so if they are not a part of this church, how do I know that they're saved? And it's like, you will know that they're in action, but by, by their actions. And then they would ask you the question, do they call themselves a disciple? Are they making more disciples? Are they following all these different things that we do? And then the answer, of course, would be no to all of those because mm -hmm. churches have different vernaculars. But the basic general takeaway that they're really trying to convince people of was if they're not a part of the international churches of Christ, they're clearly going to hell. Mm -hmm. Even if they're other Christians, even if they're Catholics, even if they have some offshoot of Christianity because they are not following the general tenets of what being a disciple is, mm -hmm. they have been charged with a very specific thing in the Gospels and they're not fulfilling that. So they have fallen short and they would convince people. And I was trying to reconcile. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I hear you. It makes sense. I mean, I was a child. They put me in leadership because I had speaking abilities. Mm -hmm. They give, they give me all of this responsibilities. They let me speak at the Rose Bowl once. They oh. let me speak in the at the in front of the congregation, I'd be like the up and comer. Oh, look at this sharp teenager mm -hmm. being able to speak. And you know, they would create this whole environment around me. You whenever you were dating people, you could only date other disciples. And only 
with other people present. You can never go on a date with somebody alone. It was oh, okay. basically what, well, I don't want to impugn any other religion, mm -hmm. but what you hear a lot of other cults doing. Yes, and there's a Netflix show with a lady in a similar type of cult. I want to say I know what you're talking about. Yes. Is it about the Mormon church? I don't remember. She, it, it's, I haven't finished it. She at some point was in Hawaii and, but it was like a dating type of thing and you needed to date like within. I don't think I've seen that one, but oh, it's maybe something. maybe a mixing. No, a mixing to the different shows. Yeah. I, I don't know what that one is, but. No, there's the. Similar sentiment. The dating one. There's this couple that it's. Got, there's like some sort of dating service and it's kind of like a cult and you needed to date within the same people of uh, their group and you had to donate a, a lot of money and there was some sort of like connection oh. or flame or I don't remember oh, what tw was Twin yes, Flames that one. yes 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 sort of similar yes. but not exactly but sort of similar yes. but okay so my whole story about how mm -hmm. I got out of that very similar to what you said mm -hmm. you had a tithe you had to give money to this church yes. and they were making a lot of money and then I was just very against some of the things they were telling me to do as a leader in that mm -hmm. church. I refuse. And they were like, you're being rebellious. If you go against the wishes and the directives of the church, you're going against God and we're going to kick you out of the church. And at that point, I was like, well, then I quit and I left. And then I went through this whole phase where I was, you know, atheistic, Yes. which I'm no longer atheistic. I wouldn't at all call myself religious, mm -hmm. but I went through this whole process and later on, that church was featured on a documentary like back in, I don't know, but they got exposed for being okay. a cult and how they financially took advantage of the members and they got exposed all those stuff. But in that cult, I met hundreds of intelligent people mm -hmm. that I would never describe as simple minded in the, in, 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 in the sense that they lacked intelligence, but they got duped into this idea and groupthink. And Rachel Ambler was part of this neighborhood community which I feel was very affected by a group think that Natalia yes. as the enemy and they were doing whatever they can to try to get her evicted. And they were eventually successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact that I mentioned simple mindedness was not to impugn her intelligence. Mm -hmm. It was the fact that she didn't look at anything critically, yes. not when Christine presented to her, not when Natalia presented it to her. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a conviction in the matter. She didn't even have an opinion. She went along with whatever, whoever was speaking to her at the time, whatever they said. That's what I meant by simple-minded. And perhaps it was the wrong phrasing. I would rephrase it as cowardice. Yes. Whether it's not, whether it's that, whether it's something else, I doesn't matter. I wonder if her reaction or her position would have been different if the cameras were not there with Natalia. I wonder that too, but she was clearly there to have a happy reconnection with yes. natalia and, and it wasn't going that <laughs> no. way she was clearly caught off guard i felt bad for her i yes. generally felt about bad for her the other thing that he said is that he says the call the tilted lawyer calling someone you don't know simple-minded isn't kind you have never met that woman you're basing your opinion on a documentary uh skewed in favor of natalia i lost his comment well he was saying something to that effect Fair. Yeah. But I was not. I was basing it on the interaction that I saw in the documentary mm -hmm. where she believed one thing that Christine was saying based on her own words mm -hmm. and then what Natalia says. And the further here's the other thing. I don't care if I'm being kind or not. I'm not being disrespectful. You exactly. know, I'm not using this to impugn her character. I'm calling it like I see it. I'm trying to objectively get to the truth. I've gone way too far on this. <laughs> but, you know, I just wanted to look. David M., I appreciate your comment. I do. Matter of fact, I appreciate him because others have, you know, tried to troll the channels like, you are clearly misinformed. Oh, really? How? They don't have a reason why. They don't have the information. <laughs> they just wanted to say that and then bolt and leave. <laughs> Anybody that disagrees with me, I appreciate. I would have a drink with this guy, David, mm -hmm. and we could talk about it. I appreciate his opinion, his perspective. But from my perspective, maybe I wasn't being kind. I'm not in the business of being kind. I'm in the business of getting to the truth. And from my eyes, from my objective perspective, I had an issue with the way that Rachel Ambler handled that situation. Mm -hmm. And I don't take back anything that I said. I wasn't impugning her intelligence. I was impugning her actions, two different things. And if people disagree with me on that, I mean, I stand by what I said. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs>
And, and so where did we leave off? I have so gone. I apologize, Dominic. You could have like given me the signal or something. <laughs> 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 Throw something at him. Yeah, like kick me, <laughs> kick me under the table. Hey, it's time to wrap that one up. Uh -uh. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things that Natalia asked Michael: How did you feel when Christine was beating me? Poignant question. Here is Michael's response: I will tell you specifically. <sighs> One day coming home from work, he's coming home from work. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. This is not verbatim. I came in, your nose was against the wall. Remember how she, they used to yes, make her stand against the wall? I think there's a video, right? Where oh, yeah. She's standing against the wall. There's video, yes. yeah. Christine got up. She looked at me. And then she points her finger in my face and says, you back your wife up. <laughs> if my wife were to ever talk to me like that and say, you back me up. And she's doing some crazy stuff like, what are you even talking about? Where do you, if your husband were to say that to you, what would you say? Oh, no. <laughs> Back you for what? What are you even doing? What's yes. going on? You know, I would be caught off guard. My wife would never, ever talk to me like that because it's disrespectful mm -hmm. for one. But she doesn't have to. That's a different, different, again, a different subject. She says, I, I lost my place. Oh, she looked at me. You back your wife up. She goes and she grabs you off the wall. I'm trying to paraphrase what Michael was saying. Yanks you pretty good. She gets you to hear. He's pointing to a spot in the house. Mm -hmm. And she says, stay out of my way or you'll never see her sons, your sons again. I believe that Christine said that. I wholeheartedly do. Be, yeah. yeah. And then he, she says, who are you? Christine is yelling at Natalia. This is Michael's account. Who are you? Where have you been? And she's wailing on Natalia, you know, the hands, fists, mm -hmm. elbows, belts, all that kind of stuff. She's beating her up. This is Michael's explanation. I'm frozen in fear. Mm -hmm. And he says, I know that if I do anything, I'm never going to see the boys again. I just wanted to have my family all together. And of all the times where you've seen Michael cry on the show, I think this was the only time where I saw genuine tears mm -hmm. from his face. There's other times, even in this interview, where it's like crocodile tears. Oh, yes. This guy's putting it's it on. But I believe this account of what Michael's saying, I'm basing that on everything I know about the show, the video, not the video, the recorded phone calls of what Christine was going on about just stay in the U.S., and she just sounds like the devil, you know? I believe that was a real threat and that Michael believed it was a genuine threat and that yes. he was in danger of losing his kids. And indeed, he does come out and say, I haven't seen my children since 2014. It's been 10 years. And right. he's just uh, reconciled with Jacob. She really did take boys and leave to Canada. That's what she did. It's believable. I mean, we see it all the time. Oh, in yeah. practice where people stay in abusive marriages I've... because the other party does the same uh, type of threat, even if it's not possible, not believable to other people. I literally Habits. have a case like that right now mm -hmm. that I'm dealing with. So uh, he says he's recording the whole thing. He's frozen in fear, never going to see the boys again. He says, I just want to have my family together. If I could just show her, he says, he reasons, if I could just mm -hmm. show her how awful she looks. So he records the whole thing mm -hmm. on video. He has it on video. She'll see how bad she is and she'll stop. She'll realize she's gone too far. And then Michael says, but she's crazy. <laughs> and when she's done, she takes you to her room. And then he says, unfortunately, in full Michael theatrics, while I'm looking at it, she shows up right behind me and says, if I ever want to see my kids again, you will delete that phone right now. And of course he deletes it. <sighs> I don't understand that response. Mm -hmm. But it feels like PTSD. Okay. Like Terrence's attorney said, Terrence, attorney, Terrence, the attorney said, it's believable if, I don't know, it's a, it's a fight or flight response. He's clearly flighting. He's not a fighter. He's clearly not a fighter. Yeah. Whenever he's confronted with anything, he flees. Yes. It happened on the first episode oh, the of season time. two. Yes. He, he gets, he books, remember? <laughs> when they were going to show him the thing about how Natalia uh, and him were having an affair. The video, yeah. I will throw this laptop across the room. Do you want me to break this? And the producer's like, please don't do that. Could you just come on, you know, with that? 
that is his response. And so it, it doesn't make sense, but I understand the psychology of him freezing in that moment yes. because he's terrified of Christine. But beyond that, beyond a very elementary, like I, I could, yeah, I could see why you think that's a circle, but I don't understand that to be, you know, a circle is how I would phrase my understanding of Michael's response. Without going too far that, we get into other stuff. Natalia has some thoughts about that. She says, Michael's a coward. And I would agree. When you see somebody in peril, you go and you act mm -hmm. or you don't. You see your children in danger, you go in and you save them. You see somebody harming your children, you do what's necessary. You put yourself in harm's way to do that. I've seen various abused women do that to men. Mm -hmm. I've seen men jump into action to protect their children. I've never seen somebody, I, I take that back, I have seen it in very few occasions, but I've never seen it like this, that severely. That is... yeah. So here's the thing. Okay, follow me on this. Follow me on this. How is that anything other than criminal child neglect? It is. You see a child being beat severely to that level. You got it on video, and you're complicit in deleting the evidence. You're complicit in letting it happen. You had full opportunity to protect and stand, call the authorities, do something. You want to freeze in fear? Fine, call 911. That's what you're charged to do as a parent. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's even admitted that, I don't understand how in Indiana that is anything other than child neglect. And even if you were to say that she's not a child, she was an adult because they re-aged her back to 1989. How is that anything other than neglect of a disabled person? Mm -hmm. It's a similar cause of action to like abuse of elders, abuse of children, abuse of disabled folks. They're kind of in the same category. And so just that admission alone, and maybe he believes because of statute of limitations or whatever, I don't understand how he was acquitted, not found guilty of something. That, of course, we haven't gone through like the entire case. Mm. I have the same question we didn't kind of address it back in season one like six months ago how we ended up getting acquitted and the jurors reasoning behind it was yeah. but again we don't know exactly how the trial played how out it, yeah how it went out but yeah. just i don't know i can see how he froze in the moment i can see freezing said, but what i don't understand is him not doing anything afterwards it's like okay yeah. in the moment yes afterwards do something go to an attorney go to the police uh, i don't know protect yourself from her taking the kids from you and then uh, do something for Natalia. But the fact that he just continued, like nothing happened, that's yeah. the part that I'm like, I don't believe that. Here's the problem with all that. All right. So he doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. He lets it go. We spent season one of him basically slandering Natalia. That too. Yes. I was going to mention like, the messages and the also Text the communications between Christine and him, they kind of tell a different story, not so much the victim. Um, yeah. He knew a lot of this was going on. He was complicit with the game plan. What was the game plan? Remember? It was either we're going to get her locked up mm -hmm. because she's trying to murder the family, or we're going to get her committed because she's crazy, or, or we're going to get her reaged. But they were, yeah. they were on the same page with getting rid of her mm -hmm. to the point where they're celebrating, oh, we got her locked up in the Rue. Oh, our doctor's uh, letter was so great. I forget the doctor's name, but they were praising it because mm -hmm. you know, that was clearly their objective. Michael wants nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. He's trying to distance himself from that. But we already got the receipts and the civil suits are going to focus on what he was on video saying. And text message saying how he's complicit in this plan to defraud the system and to get rid of Natalia. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to face some civil liability. It's still, I'm baffled at how they didn't get some kind of a conviction on the strength of, fine, she's not a child, but she's disabled, clearly. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's unequivocal. That's the one where we have uh, no... Everybody has a clear record of her abnormalities and her physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how neither Christine, well, I do understand. It was statute of limitations. The case was brought, the criminal case was brought in 2019. Okay. All of these events happened like back in 2009, 2010, 11, and 12. Okay. And so the statute ran. That's how they got off. Mm -hmm. I forget. Something so <laughs> stupid as that. But even then, 
in California, there's something called tolling the statutes. When did you have reason to believe that you might have have that you might have a cause of action because of that? That's when the clock starts, not when the incident occurs. Exactly. Maybe it's different in Indiana. I don't remember if we addressed it on the the initial episode six months ago, but that was how they beat it. Six months, I don't I don't remember what was going on. Well, you and I talked about this case <laughs> yes. about six months ago. Yeah, back in season one when we yes, covered exactly. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. It's been a while. It's been a while. So, have you ever wondered what Christine had to say about all this? Yes, and I do know that she released a statement. It was a lengthy one. Yes. I'm going to read some of it. I have her I have her statement. This is what Christine says. She didn't respond to multiple requests by the producers to speak on these allegations, mm-hmm. yeah. But she released a statement on Facebook. I want you to listen to this that I'm about to recite, knowing everything that we have discussed about Christine, the abuse, the mental and emotional and verbal abuse that she perpetrated on Natalia, the allegations about how they tried, she tried to get poisoned with pledged, Natalia tried to poison her with pledge, try to push her into an electric fence. I remember that one, all of mm-hmm. these different things. This is her response. She starts off. Natalia was a very much loved and cared for member of my family. She was not abused by anyone in my family. Let's get straight to these allegations. Nobody ever took a belt to Natalia, and the allegations that she was beaten are just plain false. Before I go any further, Mm -hmm. not only do we have video of the abuse, (laughs) not only do we have Michael's corroboration of the events, not only do we have Natalia's corroboration of events, but we also have Jacob, the son, talking about her getting kicked down the stairs. So right off the bat, whatever she's about to say, and full disclosure, I have not read this Facebook post in its entirety. Mm -hmm. I'm reading it and reacting to it in real time right now. I, I just wanted to have that. And so... Already, whatever is going to, in the next thousand words or so, is BS. Okay. I'm already kind of writing her off because that's just plain false. Anyway, she continues. Any discipline of Natalia was very minimal and was not out of the bounds of normal parenting, which I would disagree, of course. Mm -hmm. If anything, it was overly permissive as we all felt a tremendous amount of sympathy for Natalia and loved her while she was while she lived with us as a parent i have a i have good and bad days as a mom that feels like an admission yes <laughs> there were many days raising four children i depended on the power of coffee to get me through the day for example i was prone to getting exacerbated while cleaning it's a it's misspelled mm-hmm. and i am certainly not going to claim i was a perfect mom Okay, she's trying to victimize herself, yes. same as Michael. Same as those phone calls that we listened when she was in Canada, telling Michael to stay in the U.S. Anyone who has children knows that feeling of going to bed at night, hoping you have done the right things and enough for your children on a daily basis. Well, I agree with her. I know that. I am sure there are plenty of fails and some successes I had as a parent and mom, but I was not abusive to my children. If you're interested in what it was like in our house, There was a 60 Minutes piece about us before this highly sensationalized show. I believe this is on YouTube. I don't know what 60 Minutes show she's talking about. There was one about Jacob. Okay. About him being a genius and her looking like a saint. I don't know if she's referring to that or not, to be fair. I'm just going to say I don't know what she's talking about. No. I'll, I'll look into it. She continues. Natalia has made these allegations before they were investigated as unfair. Founded. Let me read that again. What? Natalia had made these allegations before they were investigated as unfounded. That's usually the way that allegations work. People make allegations and then they are investigated and they're either unfounded or inconclusive or, you know. Sustained. Right. For example, one time she ripped up her shoes, then had someone call CPS to state she had torn shoes. If she's talking about those thirty thousand dollars shoes, yes, expensive ones. I sincerely doubt she has the strength to rip up those say, like, pair of shoes. They seem pretty sturdy and I don't hard. think I have the strength to rip up yeah. those shoes like with my hands. That that would require probably like a chainsaw or something, you know, mm-hmm. or 
very strong scissors and maybe do some sort of scratches and like a, some, I don't know. They look like really thick leather. Well, you've seen that they basically yeah. look like these huge, like indestructible like, boots. Yes. Okay. So again, she's just, at this point, I'm acknowledging that she's rambling in this mm -hmm. post. That she's kind of saying a whole lot of nothing, but let me continue. CPS came and did a full inspection of everything in the home and found that she had pairs of good shoes and that she lived in a clean, tidy living environment. You know what? CPS found the same thing for Gabriel Hernandez. Yes. <laughs> the little boy that was kept in a crate or like a piece of furniture and is subsequently murdered at the, the age of seven or eight. Yeah. And they do it all the time. Yeah. That tells me nothing. Mm -hmm. The claims were investigated and dismissed as unfounded, which is not really saying anything. It doesn't mean they were litigated. It just means that, well, they couldn't find it at the time. Mm -hmm. And they don't really do an, an exhaustive search. Where to leave? Also, living with Natalia did come with con constant allegations about her treatment, which I believe was to lead people away from investigating her personal behaviors, which were extreme and usually of some sort of sexual or hurtful to towards others' natures. This is her writing, so okay. forgive me for the awkward language. So the accusations of being abused are a way to deflect what she is actively doing to hurt other people and as well. Uh, and you know what? I'm sickened already. <laughs> it's like, I just... I can't even. I, I can't even. She's deflecting. She's not really speaking to the specific allegations. She's just denying everything even though we got the receipts, even though we got third-party accounts. We got accounts from her children. We got accounts from CPS. We got accounts from uh, the FBI investigators. We got accounts from the prosecutors. Michael's corroborated. Natalia's. Although it's questionable whether 100% of everything she's saying, most of what she says is corroborated by other folks. Yes. And so Christine clearly is not participating in this. And I think that, you know, she put out this lengthy Facebook post. And you guys can read it yourself. Maybe I'll link that down in the comments. Dominic, when we do the description... I put a link to this Facebook post and you guys could read it, but I'm just, I'm done reading this. I can't. I, it's a lot of nothing. I don't have the time and we're already an hour and nine minutes in and I got other things to cover, but. She's not going to acknowledge anything. Th there's, this is not a meaningful response. It's just a bickering lady yeah. that has a purpose. She knows that lawsuits are coming. What? Whatever. At the very least, Michael showed up to the production to explain himself. I'll give him credit for that. What this is, you guys can read it on your own if you feel the need to do that. So enter Terrence Kennard. This is what Terrence says. The first time I heard him say this, I gave it some credence because, I mean, he, he is a persuasive talker and it makes sense. But I wanted to at least look in what he was saying. So it's equivalent of a good attorney. We show up to a status conference. They start raising issues that you didn't think of before. It's like, oh, well, let me look into that. And then you look at it. Oh, it's all BS. Let me explain. Terrence says, at some level, Natalia has to be accountable for her own behavior. There were from reports. There were reports of her sexual promiscuity. Blah, I can't talk. Sexual promiscuity, third-party accounts of her at the LaRue Mental Health Facility and her doing all these crazy things, which Natalia kind of explains it. She says, I don't remember any of that. They went in the documentary about her dancing for other guys and propositioning yes. on other men and, you know, doing all these sexually inappropriate stuff. And Natalia just basically says, first of all, I don't remember any of that. I was a kid in an adult section of the hospital. I don't even remember being around guys like that. But she also doesn't say that you know, I mean, it's possible. She says, I was I was exposed to a lot of sexual stuff when I was younger. But say that all that really happened. Yeah. It doesn't change exactly. the rest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, it's not an excuse for her to go through what she went through. Like, Perfect example. <laughs> I had a dependency case mm -hmm. where the eldest sibling, who was like 13 or 14, was accused mm -hmm. of sexually molesting and having actual sex mm -hmm. with his 11 or 12 year old stepsister and he was not charged with the crime they separated the siblings uh, but he was still afforded the same of protections that every minor mm -hmm. in america is afforded he's not held to the same standard as an adult mm -hmm. that boy had clearly undergone significant and severe forms of uh, child abuse and uh, the symptoms of that were his behavioral proclivities, mm -hmm. some of that for his sexual behavior, some of that for his 
acting out, poor yes. performance in school and all those other things. So the fact that she was doing that, and we've already said this on many different episodes covering this, that Natalia's behavior is more or less a symptom of the neglect and the abuse in her personal history, coming from the Ukraine, being given away to different families over and over again, not being able to attach to a certain family, being probably sexually assaulted from the time that she was a baby, being set up on dates, being offered to Christine's mm -hmm. affair partner, or whatever yes. that guy was called, to go on a date with him. And he talks a little bit about that. They didn't get too much into that. I think they were worried about lawsuits and stuff. Yes. But whatever her behavior, symptoms, not the cause, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, Antoine steps in and says that they told her that they told them, the Antoine, the man. Okay. There was a full evaluation of her psyche, psychiatrics. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with her. That's what the man said. Natalia says, this is what she says. I feel like I got exposed to sexual stuff at a really young age. She says, she talks about Christine trying to set her up with a grown man. Yes. Like she talks about it. Yeah. And then she says, Christine never told me to take care of myself or taught me how to take care of myself. Never talked about stranger danger. She asked Michael, did you know that she was putting makeup on me? Now this mm -hmm. is kind of the part where it's like, all right, that's not really. Parents put makeup on their kids sometimes like dress up. My three and four year old have like play makeup. Yes. You know, um, it's funny. They put it all over the face, look like clowns. <laughs> all the glitter. <laughs> it's just something the little girls do. Yes. And so, but this became an account. Um, but there was an accusation that she was dressed up as not kid makeup, mm -hmm. adult makeup for the adult purpose makeup. of being set up with another guy. And they cut her hair to make her short look, shoulder length, yeah. trying to make it look old. Older. older and christine said when children put makeup on it looks like a clown this is how an adult looks mm -hmm. i mean that's not inherently anything wrong with that in the context if it was to date another man that's different but you know that came out they showed the picture of mentality dressed up in makeup um, and then she asked did you know she was sending them to a guy she was sending me to a guy to try to go on a date and then they go pictures to freddie gill freddie gill being the uh, the affair partner for uh, christine Okay. And then I think I remember that Freddie basically said, no, I'm not going on a date with Natalia or something like that. Freddie said other stuff. He said basically that Christine had mentioned that he had caught Michael oh, yes. and Christine sleeping together. And then Natalia's like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Her reaction not. was yeah. so real. Like, yeah, no. there's no effing way <laughs> that give me. Come on now. <laughs> and was, and yeah. Michael too. I believe him too. I believe him. His reaction was like, no. <laughs> I think that that's probably would have wanted to throw the laptop across the yes. room back in season one. Yes. Yeah, I believe them. That's probably mm -hmm. something to put on by Christine. I don't know. But her reaction to everything else, she generally is like, did that happen? Is something? Mm -hmm. I think Natalia's very clear about some things that happened. If it clearly did not, there's mm -hmm. no, you know, I believe that. that's something that perpetrated. But that was the conclusion of episode mm -hmm. five. Let's get quickly into episode six. Okay. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because we've kind of gone ad nauseum about all of the allegations mm -hmm. and it just kind of continues down that road. But I want to talk about the mans. So they talked about Freddie Gill. Natalia started having sex with Michael. She either caught them or became aware of that. I remember Christine. They flash forward to uh, Freddie saying, I remember Christine telling me how heartbroken she was about they caught them having some kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then Michael's like, absolutely not. And I tell like, hell to the no. <laughs> None of that happened. Um, and that's just kind of where we left it. Mm -hmm. Michael wants, so, all right. So we got over that. Michael wanted to tell you to know something. He, wants her, he wanted her to know that he, harbor, he harbors no ill will towards Natalia. When he said that, Natalia goes, well, did you know that she pepper sprayed me? They recount mm -hmm. the pepper spraying thing. And then he says, that, well, I learned that about a year ago. And then he goes, she, they start talking about it. And Michael's like, shouldn't she have been pepper sprayed? Shouldn't she know what pepper spray feels like? And he's like, you know, putting himself mm -hmm. on her side. I feel like despite whatever the legal instructions, I feel like it seems like it looks like they probably had a clear bonding moment together. They did share in their trauma mm -hmm. experience with Christine. I know that, you know, you, you recall the moment where, Natalia was like, I want to pray for you. Mm -hmm. And then she gets up out of her chair. It's this very dramatic thing. 
there was a part of me that wanted to believe that it was like this genuine thing, but you know, Michael's over here crying his eyes out with no tears. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. You know, since I've been practicing for over 10 mm -hmm. years now, when I, whenever somebody cries in court, I have this, this immediate, just internal eye roll that happens. Mm -hmm. I know. It happened to me in trial last week. Yeah. Twice, and I'm like... <sighs> I always like. look for the tears. <laughs> like I feel at this point, I know what the genuine tears are. And when they start doing this whole production and, and the loud crying and the like, quiver in their voice, but their face is dry as if they're sitting in the Sahara Desert at high noon. It's like, come on, man. And, and so, but no tears with Michael in this one, right? But Natalia is sitting over him. She's praying, you know, she's learned this from Antoine and this is what they do as a family and good mm -hmm. for them. And Michael is on his knees and his eyes are closed and he has this face and, you know, he believes he's being forgiven. And Natalia says, I forgive you. And then Michael says something to the effect that, well, forgiveness erases all of this. Oh, oh right. no, it doesn't, buddy. <laughs> That's what he said. That's why he wants it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. So. We're going to leave off. He talks about, well, we talked about the pepper spray thing. Mm -hmm. He claims that he didn't know about the pepper spray. Okay. If you want to know about Michael's credibility, this is the thing. This is how we know we have the receipts about him. Yes. It's not that we haven't talked about this already, but he says that I didn't know that she did that. There's the video, right? In season one yes. of the same effing documentary that we've been analyzing. I think he should have sit down and watch season one before appearing in season two to kind of corroborate what he was going to say and be like, okay. Yes. In court depositions. Yes. In this documentary. <laughs> he's on video talking about Christine told him about mm. the pepper spray stuff. And he mentions, I think, the year and everything. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is back in 2022 when this first came out. He was demonstrating how Christine did it on camera. He literally like was doing the mannerisms that Christine mm -hmm. was using as she held the pepper spray to her face, suggesting that, well, did he see that? I mean, why is he acting it out like that? And so why he's trying to convince Natalia that he didn't know about it, I don't know. I don't know. Sheriff Bob Goldsmith, this is what he has to say about the pepper spray thing. Mm -hmm. He said that, number one, I've never heard that story before. When they were doing the investigation back in 2013, he didn't hear the pepper spray story before. But then he said that what I know about trauma with children, it doesn't surprise me that she didn't talk about it. Yes. Not all kids. I mean, kids mostly don't talk about all of their trauma like it's an open book. Mm -hmm. It's hidden in there and you got to bring it out of children. And I've experienced that trying to uh, question children on the stand myself. Yes. It's difficult to, it's, it's so complicated. The act of questioning in litigation a child about trauma. It's, it you got to be super delicate especially when i don't know if you've ever had the experience but in a criminal jury trial in a gallery full of probably a couple hundred people because it's a high profile case and you got opposing count well the prosecutor and you're the da and you're defending the criminal the accused and you got this child talking about sexual molestation i'm over here cross-examining this child how do you do that without getting the jury and everybody to hate, hate you in the courtroom? Yes. It's so delicate. I know, I know the way that I did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very calm. I never went in on the attack. I was just trying to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to prove was all of these stories that these four different witnesses are talking about are completely different. They don't match anything. They're inconsistent with what's been said before. Mm -hmm. But I can't attack the children on the stand like that. Yeah. Then they're going to hate me and they're going to automatic guilty plea, right? And so... It's complex the way that you deal with children in trauma and when you talk to them about it. We deal with it in family law all mm -hmm. the time. And there's special provisions that are taken to question children. It's to the point in family law where I've literally heard judges say, well, my child said this and that. And the judge is like, well, children say that kind of stuff all yes. the time. Yes, exactly. You know, what do you want me to do with that? Mm -hmm. Every time somebody claims that a child says something that I'm supposed to just suspend visitation, you know, you got to come with something better than that. And so we're conditioned to look for the lies. But at the same time, we understand just because a child doesn't say it happened doesn't mean it never happened. It's complex. And just because they said it happened doesn't really mean that it happened. Exactly. And I, I don't, yes, because of coaching and a million different things, that's a different show or a different day. And how people but, also... What's the word? Like construe what the child is saying. A lot of people are quick to just 
get to conclusions. Oh, for sure. When Especially children, when it comes to children. Yes. And like we go back to the simple minded children are yeah. more simple minded when they say things and adults like to put their logistics and more complicated thinking into what children say and reach these crazy they conclusions. They interpret things the way they like, want to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's just children are innocent. Yes. And when their parents don't like each other, every parent wants to be the winner. Yes. And they're good and the other parent is evil. Mm -hmm. And the parent that to the child is hearing that from both sides. And so the child's like, what do you want me to even mm -hmm. do with that? And so it's complex. Maybe we'll do a show on those kinds of things later. But they talked about the knives thing. That's when Michael was talking about the story about him seeing her in a bedroom with knives. Natalia, that was the one moment where I thought that she didn't remember all of the truth. That moment, I didn't believe Natalia. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, but it's not that. Well, there's times where I think that Natalia's clearly not fessing up to stuff. Yes. Like some of the sexual stuff, mm -hmm. some of the knife stuff. I felt like maybe she just doesn't remember. Mm -hmm. But there's clearly accounts of her having knives under her bed. That was definitely yes. a thing. There's clearly something that happened with knives. There was reports from other people about her doing stuff like that. And so she did something. And, you know, it's natural to not want to fess up to that kind of thing. Of course. Yeah. Maybe she genuinely doesn't remember some of it. There's actually um, interviews of her when she was a child with the FBI where she's kind of admitting to some of the nice stuff that she doesn't remember that she did, mm -hmm. sort of like Michael, you know? Yes. <laughs> and so Michael, Natalia is not 100% truthful, but it's not to the extent where there's receipts and <laughs> clearly she's lying. It's not to Michael's extent. <laughs> but I will say this. There are things that she has done that she's very clearly ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And I understand. She's a child. She's 22. That to me is still a baby. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for her to talk about some of this stuff. And she's not the one on freaking trial here. It's, it's never been a question about Natalia's mm -hmm. behavior. Yeah. It is a symptom of the abuse and neglect that she's undergone for since she was a child. And so Michael is an adult. He knows better. And he was complicit in all of this. Let me continue because I really do want to get to the man's we did talk about the FBI child crime specialist interview. She says something like, this is kind of her admission to her behavioral stuff. She tells the FBI agent, I think like a while after I was fully adopted, she's talking about the Barnett's that I lashed out. I started with the hiding knives thing. I hid one underneath the fridge and so clearly there was something with the knives. Yes. Clearly. She admitted it back then. I don't know if she remembered that she did that or not. But she very clearly could have been. She could have been lying. But again, she I just I'm not putting her on trial here. Mm -hmm. She probably did something with the knives. She probably did sexual stuff. I've already acknowledged that. Look, even if she did everything that she, people are saying that she did, you know, there was clearly things that the Barnett's did to accentuate, to get her to say certain things, to re-age and all these other things. But let's continue. Was Natalia a dangerous person? And this is where Terrence Kennard chimes in. And he says that why did so many people accuse her of doing bad things? And Terrence Kennard says that there are families giving identical accounts. Beth talks about Beth cares. Maybe she hid the knives for self-defense, which I don't know. I think that's kind of a reach. Maybe she was pissed off. She really did want to kill her family. I don't know. But Terrence said something about... I want to find it before I get too far off track, but there were, he talked about medical reports okay. that existed. Okay. This is what Terrence said. He said, listen, Michael and Christine took Natalia out of school simply because she didn't belong there. And even when she's not with the Barnetts, we have to remember that she lived with the Chaconis. She was homeschooled there. They're talking about when she was taken out of grade school. Yes. Right? Everywhere she's been, there are all these reports about her abhorrent behavior. The story Natalia wants to push forward now is, I was a victim. And I was victimized by the Barnetts. 
And then he talks about the mans took her to the hospital. And there were reports about they wanted to give her up and all this other stuff. And I'm going to address this. But this is specifically what the report said. And this is why Terrence is kind of full of S. Yes. <laughs> so the report that he's referring to is basically an intake patient form mm -hmm. that basically tell me what's the condition and they write down everything that you said. It could have been a nurse. It could have been an orderly. It could have been a doctor. But basically they're not diagnosing anything. Mm -hmm. They're just saying, tell me what's wrong. And it could have been Christine or Michael on the phone telling them that all of these things happened. And this is what they wrote in the report. Okay. But this is what the report said. Natalia Barnett is a 23-year-old female. Patient was brought to the ER by a friend tonight. I think that was Cynthia. Mm -hmm. For a psychiatric evaluation after becoming very angry earlier today and attacking her friend's daughter, that would have been one of the man's children. Mm -hmm. The patient states that I don't like it when the truth comes out and I don't want people to know who I really am. Today, while patient was at school, her advocate, that's one of the man's, mm -hmm. previous adoptive, I lost my place. Previous adoptive parent called her teacher and told her about her past history. This made patient very angry and patient states that why, that is why she acted out. She states patient's friends spoke to her advocate today on the phone states she has not been angry for the past two months until today so let's go back if she's been with the mans for a couple of months they found her in lafayette county yes she was meandering about the block trying to get around she didn't have her shoes with her she talks about the mans being her friends because that's they were her friends they saw yes. her and then they scooped her up and then they, they helped her that's how they eventually took her in so that's what she, She's talking about that. So it's been a couple of months and she's gone through all of this trauma. She's gone, she clearly has behavioral issues and the man's actually, they make a statement. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So in the, in the report, it says, explains that she was adopted from Ukraine four years ago as a six-year-old child. She ended up having to leave her first adoptive family's home due to trying to break their child's arm. Then patient moved in with her um, advocates and their children where she tried to poison her new mother before I go any further, Christine Mann explains, I didn't say any of that S. Okay. That doesn't, it wasn't even something that I could have said because Natalia was an adult at the time and they weren't even letting me talk to her. Mm -hmm. And it's true because on the report, it's, it has her birth date listed as 1989. But they clearly got her on the phone with somebody and Cynthia thinks that probably came from Christine. It well, the could, Barnetts, yes. which it makes sense because they bring up all of the allegations that were brought about by the Barnetts and mm -hmm. it's, it repeats itself here. But this is the report that Terrence is talking about to corroborate that Natalia had bad behavior, okay. which is so manipulative and disingenuous to yes. a jury, to the general public. Listen, Terrence, you're a great speaker. You got great court presence and you're doing a great job of advocating for the Barnetts, but for you to try to pass off this mm -hmm. report as a medical diagnosis goes against every ethical standard that was you ever swore to when you were sworn in as a lawyer in the mm -hmm. state of Indiana, and you should know better. This, trying to pass this off as, you know, this is the way that we're going to prove that Natalia was at fault here is beyond disingenuous and is straight yes. up just a lie. And he knows what the value of this report is. There's never been a report that says, oh, she clearly diagnosed with all of these other things. She, she knows for what they're talking about is behavioral actions that they haven't litigated. This is just what's been told to them. They're writing it down as, it's, as it has been said to them. It's not a diagnosis. No, it's not. And so for him to pass this off as this is the proof that Natalia was the issue is just below par. It is. In every degree. Let me continue with the letter. Patient moved in with her advocates and then their children where she tried to poison her new mother. That would have been something that came from the Barnetts. Her second family realized patient was really 23 years old and not six years old. And patient was forced to move in to her own apartment. Patient has lived alone for the past year. No patient is living with friend who brought her to the ER and her friend's daughter. Patient states she has a form of dwarfism pattern behavior, anger issues, and schizophrenia. She's not currently being treated for her schizophrenia because she was never diagnosed with exactly, that. Exactly, I was going to say. 
and does not know who diagnosed her exactly. You know why? Because the Barnetts are the ones on the phone with the doctors, and that's how they're getting these reports. She states that one year ago, she started hearing one voice and tells her to harm and kill others when she was still living with her advocates. That is another story that the mm -hmm. Barnetts have stated, and Natalia, Natalia denies all of it, and it has not repeated itself in any medical document that I've ever seen. The only time it's ever even man manifested itself is in these kinds of reports where it's basically just an intake. That's like uh, you get a new client, oh, here's an intake sheet, and they claim that, you know, this and that, but you do the yes. discovery, and it's, well, why did you lie about that? Exactly. You know? Um, <laughs> It says she's trying to hurt herself once in the past and has thoughts of cutting herself. State is, it has only one voice that it tells her to try to kill or harm people. She's angry today due to her advocate telling her friend about her past history. This is what's curious about the report. There's a second portion of it. Mm -hmm. It says, so spoke with a patient about following up with the resources given to her by social work. I explained to the patient, the people that brought her in do not want to be contacted by her after she stated she tried to call them 14 times and they didn't answer. She said they were going to give her a ride home and told her we would give her a taxi voucher to get home. A uh, patient didn't seem to understand why they wouldn't want to have her around because she states they are such good friends and she said she would try to get a hold of them again tomorrow. And I'm reading this. And Natalia would have been about 10 or 11 yes, years old. I was going to ask the age. Yeah, this report was generated in 2013, August 20th of 2013. This would have put her just shy of 10 years old. Clearly, the mans brought her there and they didn't want her to come home. Why? I don't know. The mans never expounded on what happened. But it's, let's pause for the siren. The mans never explained what happened here. No. But according to the doctors, they didn't want her to come back. Maybe they wanted to stay her, stay her to stay in there and get evaluated. Maybe they felt the need that she's clearly got some trauma, mm -hmm. wanted to work through issues. I don't know if there was good intentions or bad intentions, but it breaks my heart knowing that Natalia wanted to come home. I don't understand. They said they liked me and now they don't want me to come home. And this is a young girl that's been given up at every mm -hmm. opportunity by every person that has ever stepped in the role of her adoptive parents and the man's. And so whatever you want to think of the man's, we'll continue with that. Mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit about her condition. RAD. Okay. RAD. On September 3rd of 2020, 2010, mm -hmm. not 2020, there was a medical report written by somebody, it wasn't clear who, but it diagnosed her with having reactive attachment disorder. Okay. RAD. What is it? It's a rare, serious condition in children and involves severe disturbances in the child's ability to form healthy emotional attachments to others, usually as a result of severe early experiences of neglect, abuse, or abrupt separation from caregivers. It's important to note that RAD is different from typical attachment issues or difficulties as it stems from a child's early developmental period and has significant implications for their social and emotional lives. There uh, are two main types of behaviors seen with chil in children with RAD. Mm -hmm. Inhibited withdrawn behavior. Children with this form of RAD are extremely withdrawn and emotionally detached. They are typically unresponsive to comfort and may not seek it when they are distressed. They often don't show a preference for a primary caregiver. There's a second form called disinhibited social, dis, disinhibited social engagement disorder. This is the opposite of the inhibited type. Here the child might be overly friendly, which I think mm -hmm. is kind of what Natalia yes. had, and approach people indiscriminately, including strangers. Recall the neighbors and all. Exactly. They don't show reticence in unfamiliar settings and may show a lack of ability to understand and respect social boundaries. The exact causes of RAD are not fully understood, and it is believed to be caused by a failure. It is believed to be caused by a failure to form normal attachments to primary caregivers in early childhood. This failure could be due to severe neglect, frequent change of caregivers, or a lack of emotional response from caregivers. Diagnosing RAD can be complex, requiring a thorough evaluation by a child psychiatrist or psychologist. Treatment typically involves creating a stable, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All right. That 
describes Natalia. Natalia's to a T, yeah. right? And she was diagnosed with that. So the number one cause is the trauma. Mm -hmm. Think of the abuse. The DePaul jumped in and says, okay, so she was clearly abused. They said that she was in pain, chronic pain. Do you remember that? Have you ever seen that show House, The Doctor? I have seen a couple of episodes. The guy with the leg yes, and he walks yes, with, the yes. with the cane? Mm -hmm. Reminds me of that. But she was clearly in chronic pain because of her surgeries and her illnesses and all these kinds of things. So not only she has the pain going on, she has the abuse going on and all of the stuff that's affecting her psyche. Mm -hmm disallowing her from being able to form attachments to anybody, let alone the Barnetts who are actively abusing her. She might've had a chance at the DePaul's, but well, you know, the Chaconis got butthurt over the, they, mm -hmm. well, who was responsible for the CPS report? And that kind of killed that. They say that as far as R8, well, so Natalia addresses her mental illnesses and this okay. is what she says. And I don't know how true it is or not. I'm just going to say, I've never seen an actual medical diagnosis for schizophrenia for for Natalia. What I know of the LaRue facility is that they didn't treat her for anything. They basically said that there's nothing wrong with her and they released her. And that caused this whole issue. And that's how she got sent to uh, Tippecanoe County. Here's what Natalia says. Schizophrenia. She denies having any form of mental illness. She says, go and ask the man's about whether or not I had mental illnesses, which I'm not sure how much stock I should even put into that, given everything that's going on. But that's what she says. She does say that I can say that there's probably a little bit of RAD in there. That's probably, But the only thing that I had was RAD. I've seen so many people that don't want me. I do remember having behavior issues when I met my, when I first met my parents. <laughs> Cynthia chimes and says, oh, she was so broken. She says, we have corrected Natalia. She never came at us with a knife. She never tried to hit us hit our children. Natalia says that I used to, I was lying all the time. I was cussing. I stole stuff. I don't like to think about my past. It still hurts. She talks about her memories of the Ukraine, about how I always try to remember certain things. I don't know what happened to me in the Ukraine. One big part of the puzzle that still has a lot of holes, is it, holes in it is what happened to me when I was still over there. There was an interview she did with the FBI agent when she was a kid where she says that I think I was only there for a year, but I'm not sure, which is, you know, she would have been five when she came to the U.S. So that doesn't fit with what I know or what mm -hmm. you know. And if she's only there for a year, where was she for the other three years? I don't know. She says, I do remember that there might have been a foster family, like a mom. I remember waking up and everything was totally different. I don't know how it got there. I don't remember how it came to the U.S. They flashed to a picture of what might have been a possible adoptive family in Ukraine. Okay. And I don't know what happened with that. All of that is a mystery. Yeah, I think I remember like some sort of a um, mention of that, but yeah, they didn't explain. It gets a little further. bit deeper. And they say Michael, well, the mystery surrounding the Ukraine, the records containing her birth documents mm -hmm. were lost in a sewer incident when she was born. So the birth certificate that ages her in 2003, September 4, I don't know where that's even from. But there was definitely an, an incident where her records were lost. The judge that handled her adoption proceedings about a month later was terminated for corruption about a month after Natalia was adopted. And the records of her adoption are just simply missing. Her biological mom said, I've never seen her birth certificate before. But she up and down swears, oh yeah, she was born in 2003. Yes, she did. Now Natalia's mom, I believe her birth date is in 1980. She's old as me. Yes. Yeah, and, and I'm not old enough to have a 33-year-old. You know, no, I have a 17-year-old. <laughs> but a 33 is a bit much. Yeah. But yeah, Natalia's mom was born in 1980. She says, I didn't see her birth certificate, but that child was born in 2003. So there's some corroboration there. She's always said that. She's always said Wasn't, that. I don't know. I don't remember, but was there like pictures of her pregnant at the time or anything like that? No, but there are definitely documents of her giving birth okay. and giving up her yeah. adoptive rights. Yeah. She claims in the document, it said that she has a child, mm -hmm. another child. I don't have the means to care for this child. I renounce my parental rights. And she's kind of explaining her whole situation. So nobody's ever denied that she's the biological mom. Yes. 
Um, do you want them to take a DNA test? Sure. Let's waste our time. But nobody's ever challenged that. Mm-hmm. And she is up and down. So, yeah, 2003 is accurate. That's when she was born, September 4, 2003. Yeah. She's never seen the birth certificate. She doesn't need to. I'm her mom. I give exactly. birth. Mm-hmm. Right. Hopefully so, she remembers. <laughs> hopefully. She was relocated to the United States. Not much is known how or why that even happened. How? Um, in her interview with the FBI when she was a child, she talks about being touched in her private areas mm-hmm. when she was in the Ukraine by that one guy that put the towel over her face. Mm-hmm. And so she's going, there's a whole chunk of her life that is just this full on mystery and that is not full with a lot of good things. Yeah. It's full with a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, confusion and, you know, scary stuff. Recall okay. the mask incident. She just, she's been through it, man. Mm-hmm. Michael responds to the RAD thing, uh, AD things. This was how he explained. It. He says, so your therapist believed that you needed to be boot camped, which is not. Look, I've done a cursory search on Google about how to treat people with RAD. Boot camp was not on the list. You know, like it's boot Maury camp. Povich. Listen, send your unruly teenager to boot camp up in the Sahara Desert. That's another story for another day. But he says that we were directed to treat Natalia like she was in the military. And, you know, there was stuff. It it goes a lot. And he says that Christine basically took that and ran with it and went too far with it. And that's why the abuse, whatever. So they go into this whole adoption story with the mans. And gosh, I don't know about you, but after all of those six episodes, I was so ready to have Natalia be sent off. Mm Mm-hmm. With a happy ending. Yes. You know? And she's sitting there with the man's with this huge smile on her face and she's giggling. She can't contain herself. She's so happy. And this whole saga is over. And then they show her in the adoptive proceedings and the judge asks her, wait a minute, what's with the discrepancy with your age? Mm-hmm. This says that you're like 33, but you this, this other birth, what does your birth certificate say? And, you know, 2003. All right. So either way, you're 33 or 19. Either way, you're an adult. I'm I'm not even going to touch that. So the mans get to legally adopt her. And, you know, Cynthia is happy and Antoine is happy and hugs and the family's together. And it's this big send off. And Natalia's like, I want to write a book. And, you know, there's another chapter in my life. All these things that have happened to me have made me stronger. And we're getting ready to conclude this series. And I'm so ready to just like go... I don't know, do something else. I'm all right, I'm ready. And then mysterious phone call to the producers from Antoine Mann. Natalia's tweaking on something. She's backstabbed us over a lie. What the hell? I know. (laughs) What was that even about? And so Antoine Mann, who, who we have been looking at through all this documentary sideways, not just on the documentary, on the Dr. Phil show, you know, a number of different things. We were happy that he was helping her, but you know, something feels off. Yeah, something was. Uh. It doesn't feel all together there. Mm-hmm. And then two weeks after, before the release of this documentary, phone call to the producers. Uh, Natalia doesn't care about anybody but herself. What was that even about? I think money. That's been the speculation, but I haven't seen anything corroborate it. And no, nothing like that's been released. I know that Natalia has a uh, GoFundMe up. She's raised no. about $21,000 to help her get started. And good for her on that. Cynthia has come out and released a statement. And so I pulled the article. I'm going to read a little bit of that. So the curious case, this is from the Business Insider. Here's an article. The curious case of Natalia Grace. Natalia speaks, had a bombshell ending. That suggested that the relationship between the titular woman and Cynthia and Antoine Manns, her new adoptive parents, had soured. But according to Cynthia Manns, she she and her adopted daughter, who currently appears to be going by the name Natalia Manns, she respelled her name and took on the last name of the Manns, that they're all right. This is what Cynthia says. We are absolutely perfect. No, she doesn't live with us, but we are fine. Cynthia told the U.S. Sun, with her comments reprinted to The Hollywood Reporter, according to Cynthia, Natalia is currently living with friends. However, she told the U.S. Sun that she and Natalia speak regularly. In the final moments of Natalia Speaks, 
the second season of the investigative Discovery documentary series, Cynthia and Antoine Manns are heard saying in a phone call to producers that there was something wrong. And in Antoine's voice, something ain't right with Natalia, Antoine says in the call, which the docuseries states occurred two weeks before the final episode of the series premiered. The girl is tweaking. I feel like she's the enemy in the house. And she said to us, we have held her hostage, made us look like we are the enemy. Natalia stabbing her family in the back over a complete lie. Cynthia said that. The final episode states that Natalia's story will continue. So Cynthia declines to comment on any details of what prompted the call to the U.S. Sun. With more of the curious case of Natalia Grace on the way, I guess there's going to be a season yes. three. I don't know if I'm going to cover it or not, honestly. But in the aftermath of the call, Natalia has posted regularly on social media with accounts on Instagram and TikTok. She's also interacted with Mann's family account cordially on TikTok as Business Insider previously reported. And on Sunday, this would have been like a, a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. Natalia posted on Instagram and TikTok saying that she was taking a break. I'm taking a break from everything. I love y'all. That's what she wrote. Cynthia didn't respond to a request for comments sent by Facebook message, whatever. So Cynthia's trying to say that, no, oh, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing from Antoine. There's not really much in the way of anything concrete. Look, I've read a lot of speculation, but I'm not going to put anything on the show until I corroborate it un independently. I don't know what's going on with them. I'll just say this. I'll just say this. Being a parent is really hard. Yes. My children are three and four. And your child is probably like a perfect, innocent little angel of four months old. They're so quiet. <laughs> Mine is not so quiet. <laughs> You don't think so now. <laughs> Just give it a year when her lungs start to... No, she's not quiet at all. No. Like she's already screaming and one... I mean, oh, boy. Like babbling and she takes after her father. He talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Does so. she have the pterodactyl voice? My daughter has a pterodactyl <laughs> voice. Everything's like so high-pitched. Like, yes, you know, exactly. whenever she wants... Oh, it, it, they get louder. Mm -hmm. Believe it or I not. Know. They. You'll see. I know. <laughs> but I'll just say, look, it's hard... It is hard to be a parent. Mm -hmm. I'm so rooting for the man's and Natalia to find some kind of resolution with that. I was thankful that they rescued her and gave her some kind of a semblance of a normal childhood. Maybe what's going on is probably just like, look, I've had a hard life. I'm trying to figure out myself. I'm not fully developed. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And, you know, there's a biological family out there that kind of reached out to her. There was some speculation that it was Maybe she wanted to go have contact with them or something. I don't even know how that even fits in. But Natalia is not even living with the mans anymore. She's got her own place. She's living with friends. What happened? I could think of no circumstance where anything my daughter would say to me, no matter what it was, she could say she, she hates my guts. She wishes I were dead. There's no circumstance where I would ever actively call somebody to sabotage anything that she had going on. And what's more is I have many cases where I've experienced criminal cases where I've had two strikers and they're going to get accused of a felony and parents don't want to say anything to the police because they want to protect their child, no matter how much they've harmed or caused harm to the family. That is your instinct as a parent. I speculate is probably your instinct as a parent with your four-year-old month old you can't imagine a scenario where you would do anything to you would throw yourself in front of a train for that little loaf of bread mm -hmm. that is you know <laughs> but that is the instinct of a parent why he would go to the producers to say anything against natalia is just so I, counter I kind of throughout like the whole series i kind of have question if the man's really created that parent and child bond to the extent where he will protect her like that or yeah. if it just is it if it is just more of a kind of like a charity thing because they have so many foster children they're so used to just helping them out that's true do they really create a bond with all those children or is it just whatever their mission is to just help out children in need. Like, I don't know if they ever created that child parent bond that is necessary to, I guess, protect and protect her like that or to 
not do what he did. It's just calling the producers and whatever he did. I don't know. Yeah, I I hear that. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you got ten children, how are you going to bond with all of them? I mean, I have three. I got bonds with each of them, mm-hmm. but they're mine. I didn't adopt any of them. Yes. And I, I don't know the answers to that. But at the same time, if you're going to actively adopt, it's not like he wasn't aware of the dangers of adopting a child. You, oh, you no. take your children as they are. Mm-hmm. Exactly. RAD and all, you know, whatever, how you take them, how they come. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have to, I imagine, resolve yourself to, uh, I have thought about adopting. Me and my wife had talked, mm-hmm. not recently, but mm-hmm. a few years ago. Before. Yeah. All the other kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what if we were to just do our good deed and adopt somebody and help somebody out and we've had those talks but you know the dangers at the time was well my daughter's like who are you gonna adopt i was thinking like if is it a 10 11 12 year old uh boy or somebody you know how am i putting my daughter in danger you know i've had those thoughts and but if i was going to adopt somebody is taking them as they are mm-hmm. understanding that it might not work out and there's been stories about adoptive children mm-hmm. turning on their parents one of them in the comments very famously in our in um, the summary video was talking about how children with rad will rip up the family from the roots Mm -hmm. all the way up and destroy sexual assault claims against the dad stuff against the mom whatever and you know so i don't doubt that it's it's difficult there's probably been moments where like what are we doing with this but they stuck by her for 10 years and so for better or worse at this point there's not going to be another adoptive family Mm -hmm. nobody's going to uh supersede the man's at this point natalia's grown and so and she has a voice of her own and she is, you know, she's trying her best to find her way. Yeah. A very broken and trauma filled individual. I spoke with a therapist about Natalia and she had said, no, mountains mm-hmm. of therapy, that girl, these mountains of therapy. They Probably had, through the entire life. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Lifelong. I mean, there's she's just got demons that you're never going to slay. Mm-hmm. And she talked about Michael. Oh, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> he needs he therapy, needs too. This. But, you know, she had a different tone for that mm-hmm. guy. Um, I wanted her to come on the show, but she was she was busy. But all I'm going to say with the man's is it's not entirely clear why it ended that way. Mm-hmm. It's not entirely clear what Antoine's motive was in making that phone call. Just as a dad, I'm calling foul that he would, whatever her, his issue was with Natalia, that he's going to go and try to sabotage her documentary. All the hate and vitriol she's already getting from the show, from a certain segment of the community, he's going to pile on and give them more ammunition for that. It just strikes me as cowardly for a lot of the same reasons that he was trying to pass judgment on Michael. On Michael yes. It was heartbreaking because it was like, oh, I was so hopeful that it was going to not go that way. But you know what? I have seen at the same time in the way that they express themselves, a lot of similar similarities between Michael and Antoine, like that showman. and Oh yeah. The theatrical, the yeah, theatrics. The theatrical mm-hmm. stuff. And, I don't know. Who knows? I don't know if Antoine is a preacher or not, mm-hmm. but he has that very Midwest Southern feel of the, the you know, the theatrical preacher. Yes. I agree. But at the same time, I don't know if that's the case or not, but he certainly has those mannerisms. So I'm not putting it beyond the, beyond him. My only hope is this, and we're going to wrap up Natalia Grace forever, unless there's a reason to talk about them in season three. If there's mm-hmm. some crazy stuff, maybe we'll, we'll revisit Wait. this, but it's time to get on to other stuff. <laughs> Here is my hope for Natalia. I want her to find peace. I want her to find independence. And whosoever may be trying to profit off of her story, I just hope that she's going to be okay. If the mans are somehow trying to profit off of Natalia, and that's why they're upset because they thought they were going to get a bigger cut of the pie, I don't know. I just want everything to be okay. And if the man's look for whatever they might be trying to do now, there was a benefit to all of it. They gave her some semblance of a childhood. Yes. Even if it wasn't a good one, even if it wasn't a perfect one, it was something, you know, it wasn't what the Barnett's did. And so I'm thankful to them for that. And whatever they're going through, is it greed? Is it ego? Is it something else? I hope they resolve it amicably. 
even if it's not possible, I just want Natalia to find peace. The mans are grown, they're fine. But for Natalia, I wish her all the best. And I truly hope that she gets the therapy that she needs and deserves. And I'm going to end this series with that. And for all of you who have followed our show uh, through episodes uh, one through six of our review of the Natalia Grace documentary, thank you for sticking with us. We've now covered this particular topic for over 10 hours now of content that mm -hmm. we put out on YouTube. Um, it's been a pleasure covering this case, um, but we are ready to conclude it now. And I thank you guys all. And uh, that's all we have for you. We'll see you guys next week when we talk about the Gypsy Rose case. Yeah. And um, get ready for that one. It's going to be a doozy. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.